things and perform. Oh, okay. So we'll start recording. Um, Sorry. So uh, the crime scene technician is whose primary duties are to respond to crime scenes and perform the following duties. Uh, photograph the crime scene and any evidence uncovered at the scene. Dust for latent fingerprints. Collect, package, and transfer physical evidence. Uh, not to be, be denigrating it, but it's basically, we called it bag and tag, uh, that, uh, what you would do at the crime scene. Uh, some of these people have just limited duties. Uh, that's what their responsibility is, photographing, dusting for prints, and bagging and tagging the evidence. A crime scene investor can also be a police officer with special training assigned to a crime scene unit. So you know, they can be civilian or they can be sworn. Uh, training may include photography, physical evidence collection, bloodstain pattern analysis, basic bullet path analysis. Uh, what crime scene, uh, what CSIs don't do, and I, I don't do, I didn't do in my, my four years, is uh, I never chased down and apprehended a suspect. I didn't conduct interviews of suspects, although I sat in on interviews to hear what they had to say, and then we would sometimes test their there, what the statements they made against the, you know, what the evidence was. We don't insert ourselves into investigations of cases in which they, a family member or a personal friend may be involved. Uh, you know, the show frequently, you know, you know I remember Mark Hel Helgenberger's, uh, um, uh, Catherine Willow's character saying, you know, I want this case, so-and-so. No, that doesn't work that way. That would be a conflict of interest. So, you definitely do not, uh, you know, you recuse yourself from any involvement in the case. Uh, we don't wear Armani or any other high fashion attire to crime scenes. I, there's no point wearing a $1,200 suit to an, uh, an arson fire or a, blo a, a bloody crime scene. So uh, you generally wear, you know, khakis and maybe a polo shirt. Uh, sometimes you uh, cover yourself in, um, in Tyvek uh, uh, crime scene uh, gear, but very rarely, uh, you would. I, although I have to admit, my, very early in my career, we had to wear a suit and tie to the to the crime scene and to the autopsy. But um, you know, when your where your tie dips into something that it shouldn't, uh, you know, it's it's kind of embarrassing. Um, so, what other agencies have crime laboratories? Well, in the United States, there are federal agencies such as the FBI, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, U.S. Secret Service. U.S. Postal Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Army Crime Laboratory, and Naval Criminalistics, uh, Criminalist uh, in, or Criminal Investigation Service, or NCIS. So those are the federal agencies that generally have crime labs for what, uh, various reasons. Uh, state agencies, such in California, we have the Department of Justice Bureau of Forensic Sciences that have a number of, number of labs uh, scattered throughout the state. Uh, they're generally located in less populated areas, uh, they're in you know, Fresno, uh, they're up as, uh, in uh, Eureka, just out of uh, uh, um, Salinas. There's also one down in uh, near uh, Santa Monica, uh, not Santa Monica, Santa Barbara, so uh, and uh, Riverside and Redlands. So they're they're spread out uh, uh, throughout the state. Then uh, there are county laboratories, and county laboratories are usually associated with sheriff's departments. So in in Bakersfield. The uh, Kern County Crime Lab was initially with the Kern County Sheriff's Department and then became uh, under the umbrella of the D DA's office. And city laboratories are usually asso associated with police departments. So you have Los Angeles Police Department as an example, San Francisco PD, uh, San Diego PD. So those are associated with uh, police departments. In Kern, the only crime lab, and I wouldn't call it a lot crime laboratory, it's more of a technical investigations unit um, as the BPD. Uh, the Sheriff's Department or um, uh, usually had contracts with other cities in, in Kern County to provide, you know, the bag and tag uh, photograph and dusting services and also would go to autopsy and take photographs. Uh, and then if it was a major case, our crime laboratory, either with the Sheriff's Office or DA's Office would respond and assist as well. So it's a kind of a symbiosis or um, we each each agency sort of assisted each other. Um, what other agencies have crime laboratories? Well, there may be regional laboratories that is, are associated with a medical examiner's office or coroner's office and the uh, 
the uh, LA County Coroner's Office is an example of that. And some are associated with the uh, university. Um, in uh, Florida, for instance, there are some uh, laboratories associated with uh, a university. Um, there are also private laboratories that are that contract with state, county, or municipal laboratories. Mainly those are DNA uh, analysis laboratories, or if it's something special like some kind of audio recording type thing, uh, that's, the, that's their, their main bailiwick. So what you're asking, what is a criminalist? So I was hired as a criminalist. A criminalist is a trained scientist that analyzes evidence using scientific methods. They prepare a report on their analysis, and then they testify to their opinion in a court of law. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, what a criminalist is. Uh, education and training. Well, most criminalists have to have a minimum of possessing a bachelor's degree in a natural or physical science, such as chemistry, biochemistry, physics, molecular biology, biological science, or a forensic science. There are uh, some universities that offer forensic science degrees. So they're basically strongly grounded and dedicated to laboratory casework. Um, so some of the uh, education is they, again, they, some may have a degree in computer science with the advent of cell phones and digital pagers and digital assistants and such. Uh, there are, uh, some criminalists can have a, a background in digital, uh, digital uh, science or computer science. Um, they may have uh, training in Microsoft Net or other network management. So the yeah, question is, do all criminals respond to crime scenes? No, they don't, not all. Uh, the crime scene response unit is primarily made up of volunteers. Uh, the majority of criminals do respond to crime scenes. Um, in current, they receive a 5% bonus and can receive paid overtime for responding to crime scenes after hours. So. Um, in current, that would be a pretty busy, uh, that's a pretty lucrative uh, gig if you can get it because uh, uh, the, the overtime hours are definitely there and they're usually long, uh, so it can really supplement your income. So what kind of crime scenes do criminals respond to? Well, uh, criminals don't go to every, every little burglary and such. They generally go to major crime scenes and it's usually the request of uh, uh, the investigating law enforcement agency. So like BPD and the sheriff's office, the crime scenes are usually complex or some special process or expertise is needed, such as you know, doing a, a, a bullet trajectory analysis, bloodstain pattern reconstructions, other physical reconstructions, or, or using special chemicals to enhance the presence of blood or identifying semen or other materials. So uh, some criminals, since with their chemistry background, also respond to illegal drug laboratories and sometimes are called into uh, uh, complex uh, fires or explosive uh, explosion uh, cases. So um, I mentioned you know, what, you know, what they do. There's also trace evidence collection, uh, you know, finding uh, traces of hairs, fibers, small particles, gunshot residue and such. Um, they also, you know, like for instance, at an arson scene, they might use uh, some techniques to identify flammable liquids or explosive residues or reconstruct a, an explosion or a fire. And then they were also, like I said, respond to uh, illegal drug laboratories. We call them clandestine labs. So, and the question is, is do you television or does television accurately, accurately portray what a criminalist does? Well, yes and no, you know. There's always that gray area. Uh, crime scene dramas such as CSI, um, Bones, Rizzoli and Isles, NCIS, they often take uh, quite a few liberties. Uh, I remember participating or consulting on a, on a case with a writer for CSI. It was about an arson case. And so I gave her the, the nuts and bolts of arson investigation and, and the things that would uh, you know, be associated with that, the techniques, and methods. And then when the show came on about two weeks or three weeks later, they called me and said, this, uh, your episode's gonna be on. And then I looked at it and it wasn't anything like, uh, like I thought it was. I mean, I, we had just purchased one of those big screen uh, TVs and I almost threw my shoe through it uh, because I was just so disgusted. So I talked to my friend, uh, David, you know, with the show and he says, oh, well, you know, 
Sorry about that, but uh, you know the, the, the director, ha you know, he has the final call on what goes on. So it's uh, you know artistic uh, liberties that they take, or artistic license, I suppose. And um, you know, I, I was a bit upset about it. And then he called me back a couple of days. He says, "Oh man," and he goes, "You should see the mail we got on that episode. You were right." So I think they they started to listen to me, at least on as far as in the Vegas episodes. Uh, and then there's docudramas such as forensic files or cold case files or extreme forensics. Um, they tend to put a more realistic spin on it. Uh, usually they come and uh, spend some time in the laboratory. They set up their little special lighting effects uh, such as uh, uh, forensic files does. And they interview you and you, you uh, kind of do uh, a little bit of a reconstruction of what you did. Uh, you have to have the evidence in place. So um, yeah, there are you know, those tend to be a little more realistic. So uh, that's essentially a nutshell. Um, um, what that's all about. So um, where are we in terms of time? Well, we had a half an hour. So I thought this evening I'd do something a little different. Um, uh, as I was talking to uh, uh, the people who put this uh, this program on, they said, well, you know, the, the Bruno Vista Museum is a uh, deals with Kern County history. And I said, well, great. I think I have a case that I can put on or describe to you about um, uh, that, that has a historical value or historical connection to Kern County. Um, it was an interesting case from, it was one of the last cases I worked and I hadn't worked a case quite like it. So I think I'll share that with you this evening. Take probably a little, a little bit time to load. All right, this is a this is a case that I worked in Kern County. I call it the uh, an unusual tool mark fracture mark case. And uh, it has to do with uh, basically pilfering and uh, uh, robbing of material from a historical site. So what it is, is I basically ma uh, physically matched a 19th century cast iron smokestack. So for uh, further ado, let's see. Okay. Come on here. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Ah, there we go. Well, okay. There we go. Go oh, on, come on. All right. Uh, in Kern County, gold mining started uh, around 1851. Uh, the mining in this area was of two types. It was load or quartz mining, uh, which is load is mean you basically dig a hole in the ground and you, you start looking for gold or placer mining where you uh, set up a sluice box and you, you run it through uh, in a river or a creek or something and uh, get your gold that way. So the price of gold in the late part of the 19th century to mid 20th century uh, was about $35 to $75 per ounce. And then since World War II, the price of gold was set at about $35 an ounce. And if anybody looks at it, it's kind of fluctuating today, but at some point it's nearly $1,600 an ounce. So uh, having gold uh, can be quite a, a good investment if you get in early. So the Amelie Mine is where we're talking about. Uh, it's a mine located in the foothills near Bakersfield, near the co old county seat of the uh, former mining town of Havila. So you can take Highway um, 58 you know, um, East, and then you turn off on one of those exits and you go down the, what they call the Lions Trail. And the little red mark here, I hope I can see you. Let, let me do it, okay, all right. So this little red mark here points out to where the uh, the Amelie Mine is. So this is the Amelie Mine as it probably was in the uh, maybe the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, 
you know, they had a general store and an assay office and such. Uh, this is what it looks like pretty much today. Uh, there you can see the old general store assay office. You can see the uh, uh, where they did the uh, ore processing, the rock smashing or whatever you call it, uh, crushing ore crushing there. Uh, there's some other outbuildings. Uh, it's now under the control of the Bureau of Land Management. So that's why they contacted me. Uh, here's just some of the outbuildings there that are located. Uh, some of them are half painted, kind of an odd kind of thing. They're abandoned. There's a there's a rock house with a chimney with the tin roofing. Uh, another outbuilding, possibly bunk bunk room. And it just set up you know in the in the hills there. You can see it just off the road when you're traveling. So here you got the ore processing area. And the area in question is uh, there's a boiler here that ran the rock stamper or rock crusher. It was a boiler with a steam engine, steam drive. So that's what ran the system. And that's what was starting to be uh, vandalized or, or uh, people were removing material from it. Oh, somebody had a chat there. Uh, All right, I'm not sure what that, this run, no, I, maybe I'll run it down. I'll take questions later if you don't mind. And I do remember the spaceship episode. Believe me, that was one I had to consult on. Um, but I'll, I'll talk to you later about it. Um, let me close this out. So again, just some views of, you know, people over time have gone and, put their graffiti on it, vandalize the, the site. There was a little uh, rock and adobe outbuilding behind that. You can see it just falling in disrepair. So it's kind of dangerous kind of to go there. You can see this pond. We don't know, you know what, what kind of materials uh, ended up going into this pond as a result of the mining work done. So uh, here's the old stamp mill. The old stamp mill was actually removed and put in another uh, location, but that was inside this building at one time. And so this is a top view down, you know, standing up on the hill and then inside looking down in the ore processing area. And then this is a shoot for the dregs of the material that were uh, processed by the mine, crushed rock. And then they had this debris field that just runs all the way down the hill. You know, as you can see all this, this rock running down. There's the, the elevator uh, for one of the shafts. Uh, it's basically collapsed. But just vertical shafts. So if you're not careful and you're walking around there, you could fall right into this window. And sometimes, and from the smell coming from the shaft, it's, you know, probably some animals fell in it, deer, uh, cattle, you know, whatever else might be. So you could know that something, uh, you know, fell in and never got out. And then there's a uh, horizontal shaft and it's quite a large shaft. You could, it's almost wide enough to drive a, a you know, small Jeep through or into, I should say. So does anybody want to take a tour of a gold mine? Well, I'll take that as a yes. So uh, here's the shaft going in. And you can see the timbers are there and the, how the, the granite rock has been, uh, been chiseled out, bl blasted away. I think you can see here where they do the boreholes right here and then put the dynamite to fracture the rock. And here's some of this quartz vein material where the gold would be. I don't know if there's any gold in it. And then of course the little denizens in there, you know, we're in the bat cave and uh, he was in there all by his little lonesome. And then of course, uh, you know, when you see a light at the end of the tunnel, you hope that it's not a train coming the other way in this instance. No, there wasn't. So uh, that's a little bit about the mine and the assay office. These are just updated photographs. Uh, inside the assay office, the uh, 
the tin plate on the ceilings and walls were removed for uh, scavengers. So here's what, you know, at one time where the, where the uh, boiler and such was, and then there's the location, you know, next to it is what, what it looks like today where things have been removed, stolen. So here's the boiler, steam engine. So what this uh, this crime was, a person was, went in there and was caught with the uh, the materials from the boiler, the the, uh, the cast iron material, and it the crime falls under something called ARPA, the Archaeology Archaeological Resource Protection Act, and that was passed in '79 and strengthened in '88. Of course, when I looked at this, it was around 2012. And according to an article written by Robert D. Hicks, ARPA prohibits people from excavating, damaging, defacing, altering, or removing archaeological resources um, and attempting these acts from public or Native American lands without permit. An object or resource that is evidence of past human existence only needs to be 100 years old and located on public or American Indian lands to be protected by ARPA. The crime is a felony if the value of the resource, commercial and or archaeological, uh, and the cost to repair the damage from illegal acquisition exceeds $500. So it's not much. The interesting part about that is when I was uh, touring uh, um, the Nali in Alaska, we were on this little hike and there was a bunch of just metal tin cans uh, laying off the side of the hiking trail. And the uh, guide told us that, you know, because those cans were more than 100 years old, they couldn't be touched. So whatever the miners or whoever was, you know, the um, uh, whoever was, you know, um, wor working in that area and left their debris there, their trash, uh, you know, that's valuable trash. And if you, I, we disturbed it, it would be a $500. It could be a fine and a felony. So that's that was kind of interesting to me. So uh, just basically over a year ago, and this was when I, uh, 2002, sentencing guidelines were put in place for cultural resource crimes, including ARPA violations. And the person convicted of an ARPA violation could forfeit all archeological resources and tools used in commission of the crime, including vehicles. In addition to forfeiture, penalties are lodged for the crime. Penalties for a misdemeanor ARPA conviction are a $10,000 fine or up to a year in jail, and penalties for a first felony conviction are $20,000 fine and up to two years in jail. Penalties for a second felony conviction are $100,000 fine and up to five years in jail. And civil penalties can also be lodged against the convicted. The statute of limitation to prosecute someone for an offense is five years from the date of the occurrence of the criminal case and seven years from the date of the occurrence of a civil case. So the government is trying to make you know, this serious. So let's look uh, at, at our evidence in our case. So this is the picture of the boiler again. This photo was taken in 2009. My case was in 2012. And metal was being uh, illegally harvested from the site. And scrap iron prices at that time were about 15 cents a pound at 100 pounds minimum. So you can make some money. The guy had a car and a trailer. Uh, he and his girlfriend went out there with a chop saw and began uh, working on the metal there. So my involvement was that the U.S. Department of uh, Bureau of Land Management, they're trying to keep and preserve the site, uh, but they still lack uh, adequate funding for protection and restoration of these sites. So uh, it's kind of a, a hard, difficult job for them. But here's what, uh, what came into the crime library. This is a view of the smokestack remnant that I received. And you can see it's flattened out. It's uh, cast iron, it's, uh, you know, Iron metal, rusted, it has some seams on it, rivets. So this is what was brought into the lab. So here we have uh, the view of the smokestack remnant uh, as I received it. You can see it was flattened out so the guy could load it on his trailer with some other materials. And then um, this is the, uh, the smokestack remnant that the Bureau of Land Management sent me. Uh, and it's the uh, uh, it's round, it's roundish, uh, and they you know removed it from the uh, from the boiler. And you can see here it is uh, another view of that what the uh, BLM sent me from the site. 
Uh, this is the chop saw wheel or grinding wheel that was used to cut up the, uh, the metal from the uh, suspect's tools. Uh, here's his chop saw with a new blade on it. You know, it sees from his pickup. So I tried to you know, put this thing together. I thought I could do it a contour alignment or, or match, try to figure out, you know, to get it together. The problem was the chop saw removes a section of the metal. It's not just, you know, it actually cuts away and there's a, a removal of metal, you know, uh, as wide as that chop saw blade is. So you'd never get an exact physical match. Although I could kind of line it up with drip patterns or rusting patterns. Um, so this is what my attempted alignment is, but it's it's not a perfect alignment. I also I could probably say is it could have come from this uh, from this um, chimney. And if anybody remembers the Lindbergh case, the Lindbergh kidnapping case, um, the uh, suspect in that case, Bruno Richard Hauptman, he built a ladder so he could uh, 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 get to the higher story where the kid's uh, Lindbergh child's bedroom was. And so he used his wood from the rafters in his garage. And when the uh, state uh, forester looked at this wood pattern, he, this in the middle there, this was missing what's in the middle. And this was his pencil drawing of what he thought the, uh, the wood grain would be. So he put this in, this little, uh, to show that he felt that indeed that the uh, rafter and apart from the ladder uh, match or were one common piece at one time. And that was pretty impressive back in uh, you know, the early 30s or 20s when, uh, when that Lidberg kidnapping occurred. So that was some evidence that he put in. So I thought, well, can I do this? So again, we're looking at the contour of it. I can kind of line it up. In fact, what I had to do uh, for this uh, piece from the suspect, I had to get some wood and some floor jacks and jack and pump and pump and until I got that um, that chimney pretty round. I managed to turn a flat chimney into, into a round chimney, but you have to be very careful. This metal is very brittle. It'll break off. And um, you can see here where pieces have been pried and twisted. Uh, when the guy was cutting, he, he would have twisted it. So this is the alignment uh, that I tried to make with it. it. It shows general agreement, but it's not really uh, what I call, you know, it, absolute. You know, I, I want to absolutely prove that this chimney came from uh, the one at the mine site. So what drew my attention was this rivet here with a piece of metal attached. And you can see it here. Um, so what I'm calling item 2A uh, and item two is one piece is from the, from the chimney and the other uh, from the uh, BLM chimney, other pieces, the suspects uh, was removed from his truck. So I, I keyed on this rivet here and I want you to keep watching. So I found this piece 2A, it had broken off during the, uh, you know, uh, uh, process, but if you look here, just follow the contours along this river, I now have what I call a fracture match uh, of, uh, of this metal to this other portion of metal. So item one and item 2A uh, are now, in my mind, uh, from, the, from the same source. So let's do a little close-up view of that. And so you can see now we can follow with this, with this uh, uh, pointer that I can show where this was at one time, one piece of metal and it had been attached. So here's item one, which is for the suspects uh, stuff, uh, evidence, and then this is from the, the mine site item 2A. Little close up view. So now we can really follow, you know, this, this little fracture, it's, it's pretty amazing that I could find that. So it's kind of funny, I think it's ironic, that uh, the resource inside that mine uh, was, you know, I think if he would have spent the time in the mine, he might have gotten, you know, something, an ounce or so for uh, over $1,600 instead of something for that paid 15 cents a pound. And so the suspect had in his possession two receipts from a scrapyard totaling 900 bucks. 
the money was used to support he and his girlfriend's uh, meth methamphetamine habit. They were convicted. And then, you know, Kern County is famous for its gold. Um, so this is the largest nugget, 156 ounce gold nugget from the Stinger District in Kern County. So, you know, gold mining in, in Kern County is a, was, a, was and still is to some extent a, a, a lucrative activity. So that basically ends it about there. Um, I'm probably going to just answer one question right away. It says, well, Greg, have you ever been on the TV show CSI? Well, I'll let you judge for yourself. You got to watch, you know, don't blink. <laughs> Okay, did you see me? Well, maybe I can help you out here a little bit. <laughs> Let me see if I can help you out a little bit here. All right. Can you see me now? I'm there, believe it. Like I said, if you watch this episode, you better have a DVR with a decent freeze frame. If this doesn't convince you, maybe this will. Right there, the guy in the uh, orange and uh, or yellow and red Hawaiian shirt with the khakis, that's me. So that was an episode they filmed uh, uh, with the CSI guys in Hollywood uh, solving a crime. So anyway, that's my, uh, that's my experiences. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, watching and listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be able to take them now. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if no one has any other questions, um, thank you, Mr. Laskowski, for your time today and for sharing your knowledge with us. It was quite exciting, as a matter of fact. Uh, the museum would always love to have you back again soon. And before we go, I would just like to mention again to everyone that if you have enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation at buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. Your generosity is what make it, makes events like this possible. Thanks again, everyone, for coming. And please keep an eye out on our website for our next Meet the Expert event and other events like this. Thanks again, everyone. Wait, someone, uh, someone did have a question. They put it on the chat. <laughs> so okay. if, you don't, if you don't mind, I'll read it. It says, I, I'll tolerate a limited number of artistic license, but I have limits. The CSI Miami, where the private spaceship with eight paid passengers in a scheduled week-long orbit had a problem where they decided to kill one of them to save oxygen. The obviously fake stuff was a tsunami of physical violations. I stopped watching it and several years ago, Miami has been discontinued. So <laughs> to answer that question, I did have something to do with that episode. I mean, I was surprised when I got the script and the questions because they were primarily two, they had two interests. One is how fast would oxygen disappear out of the, um, um, out of the spaceship if there was a bullet hole in it. And then the other one was um, about uh, a bloodstain pattern analysis. Well, in both cases, I mean, I said, well, I don't know how, how fast the oxygen would disappear. Obviously, you'd have an immediate decompression with the oxygen uh, going out of a, a bullet hole, but I, I couldn't tell you how long it would take you know, for, the, uh, for the oxygen to deplete. Uh, and then as far as the bloodstain pattern uh, uh, analysis, because I said, no one's been in space, been murdered to do you know, looking at blood stain, but I did spend countless hours watching videos from the International Space Station where, you know, they were, um, astronauts on, on board were, were doing things with liquids and I could see that was globular and, and that other than for, um, uh, you know, lack of gravity, there's just momentum. So I sort of, ex sort of explained some things, but, you know, it's like, there's just some things that go beyond uh, my capabilities, so. Anyway, um, that's it. I think that that covers the questions. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. We do appreciate everything here, and it was very interesting. Everything you shared with us tonight. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs>